Hello everyone, this is Ben, and in this video we're going to be talking about who wrote the Bible. I made videos about this before, but this one's going to be a lot better because I've studied and studied a lot more about this and learned a lot more. So, the question before us is like, not a question of, did God write the Bible? And, but rather... Of the copies of the Bible that we have, how do we know who the human author was? So that's really what we're looking at. Who, who were the human authors? Because the Christian doctrine of biblical inspiration is that God moved through human authors, but their, their personality, their knowledge, like who they are, is present in that text. And God worked through that. So it's not like an idea that, you know, God just sat down and said, now write this and now write this word and now write this word, you know. But rather that God moved through them. And so we're not really looking at the doctrine of divine inspiration of these human authors for the sake of this video. But rather just the human authors. Who are they? Who really wrote the Bible? And what I find is that this issue is a little too important. Um, <laughs> for Christians, it's, it's obvious, obviously the Bible is sacred. And uh, so that, that, that should be obvious. But the weird thing is that the Bible is pretty sacred for atheists too. So like, it's just weird um, how important it is. So like, there's two questions before us, really, that we've got to take a look at. And the question is, like, in the process of how the Bible, the Bible was copied and recopied, did the people who copied it change it? Did they change it? And, uh, in other words, we don't have any of the original, you know, like the one where, like, Paul signed his name. We don't have any of those. We don't have any copies of those. We don't have any copies of the copies of those. We don't have any copies of the copies of the copies. You know, like, we have lots of copies from the ancient world, but in the, I mean, the paper that they used back then was made from a type of grass that had this juice in it that would make it like, when you put it, when you pressed it together, it would kind of, make this paper like stuff and uh it would rot like it would literally have rotted by now so like there's nothing you can do other than recopy it when it gets old and worn out and rotted you have to recopy it. it's, it's made from grass it's a it's a it's a type of grass that's good at doing this but like how do we know like uh did paul really write this like it says, you know, like you open up and it says Galatians, you know, the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Galatia or something like that. Um, you know, do we really know that these are Paul's words? Or in the process of recopying and then re-recopying and then re-recopying, was it changed? Um, and then there's an added question that we need to address, like, of what's called forgery. Um, where like essentially when the when the the scribe who recopies it because in the ancient world before the 1400s or like the, I forget when it is the middle of the 1400s let's look it up uh, Gutenberg printing press Gutenberg printing press all right uh, let's see. 1439 okay so before that everything that you're going to get is going to be handwritten like a guy is going to literally write by hand there was a printing press that existed in china around 1000 a.d but that's kind of a sad story they they had it and didn't see the value of it like they would carve in wood and and then they could make copies of things by just putting paper over that and ink and, and rub it and then it comes out and you've got a copy. But they never used it for anything other than cooking recipes and poems and like they didn't actually use it for you know like science or like 
or philosophy or, you know, to carry on debates or the news or like, or law books or historical records. Like, you know, it's a, it's a little bit sad, but like when you get the 14, the Gutenberg printing press in 1439, that's largely considered the most important invention in human history because what that does is it allows you to spread information it makes books cheap and a lot of people can read but before that everything that was written was written by hand like a like a guy would sit down and you would hire a guy who could write called a scribe and he would write it down and like did he change it you know like like we don't have the original that you know supposedly Paul would have written so how do we know that in the copying process it wasn't changed? Then in addition to that, we don't... So we're just that that in uh, what we're talking about for this video, in the, the term for this, the, 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 I don't know, the discipline within, histor within history is called textual criticism, which is like kriteo from the Greek, you know, like judgment, judging the text itself. Like, can we reconstruct the original from the copies that we have can we work backwards and weed through these weeds of what's called interpolation interpolation just means that the scribe that was recopying it made a change okay um now if the entire text of say some book of the bible like galatians or something like that was not written by the person that it claims to be written by then that's not an interpolation. If you if the whole text is an interpolation, that's called a forgery. So what we're asking for the sake of this video is: Was the Bible forged? Were book or were books of the Bible forged? Were they interpolated? And were they so heavily interpolated that like we can't reconstruct the original? Or do we have a way, a method? You know, what is what are the techniques of textual criticism, and how do we get back to this? And this is fascinating to me because it's uh, really, you know, uh, what fascinates me is uh, how sacred this is for, for atheists. Um, it seems to be something that atheists, like, you don't get a lot of, like, Hindu, I, don't, I don't run into Hindus online or Muslims online who, you know, say that the Bible, well, actually, I think some Muslims do, but... I don't know, it just seems so important uh, to to atheists. And so I'm like looking at, like, uh, you know, I, like if you, it, this, this topic seems to come up all the time. Like if you're debating religion, you're debating Christianity and whether or not it's true, people go to this, Christians go to this topic, atheists go to this topic, and, uh, you know, it, I don't know. It's just like any any debate. It seems like people are drawn to this topic, and I, and I, I think people fail to realize that um, I'm I'm scrolling through some like comments. Cause there was one comment that didn't have anything to do with this, and you get all these atheists like firing back and disagreeing with the Christian guy, and uh, it was really fascinating to me that like you know, I mean like they they went there. And it was like, how did you get to this? And so, I don't know. I, I'm not finding the comment, and I don't have to find it. You know, you can go look, and uh, I don't know. We, I guess, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not going to find the comment. So we're gonna. We're not going to drag you down with that. But like, my point is fairly simple. You know, all I'm saying is that Christianity. For Christianity to be true, there are certain things you have to believe to become a Christian, to be, or as people say, be saved, to be born again, to believe in Jesus. You don't, when people become Christians, they don't know the whole Bible and what every, everything that the Bible says, so they can't possibly believe the whole Bible. Um, but they're still saved and they're still Christians. So like, uh, the, uh, there's a core message of Christianity. It, it goes something like this. There's a perf there's God out there who's perfectly good, you know, all powerful, all knowing, you know, classical theism, a big concept of God. And then here's us and we're sinful and separated from God. 
And then Jesus came and he made these incredible, you know, from a from an apologetic standpoint for proving this stuff. Basically, we can prove God's existence without using the Bible at all, and which is what the Bible tells us to do. And I won't go into that for the sake of this video, but if you want to look more into that, uh, look at the video, uh, Why Study Apologetics. But you can prove, you know, the Bible tells us, it doesn't tell us how to prove God exists. It tells us where to look for the proof. And through, it says that, you know, God has written a, a book other than the Bible, which is his creation, and we have to study God's creation. And if you think that you should read the Bible because God wrote the Bible, because it's God's word, well, God has another book, and he expects you to read that book too, and study creation and learn things about God. And that's what the apologetics is all about. Not silly, ooh, uh, you know, I like the way that tree looks and it's pretty, so therefore God exists. But serious, hard-nosed reasons to believe in God that really are hard to get around unless you just ignore them. And uh, what we find is that, yes, we can know that God exists and we can know a lot of the attributes of God. But for Christianity to be true, specifically the Christian religion, we still don't need the whole Bible, but we need parts of the Bible. We need to be able to prove that, like, you know, Paul wrote Galatians. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. You know, um, that would be sufficient. We, There are, I mean, like, Philippians, you know, it would help to have Philippians, 1 Thessalonians. If we could reconstruct what were, what did Thessalonians or Philippians or something like that those books of the Bible look like in their original form when Paul wrote them, then that becomes, he becomes this guy that like tells us these things. Um, when it comes to the other, you know, in other words, he claimed to have witnessed Jesus Christ back from the dead. Okay. And uh, was taught this stuff about Jesus and that that was why he was willing to die. And that's, you know, he's, he's faced death over and over again. Uh, when it comes to the other uh, apostles, the, the easiest route, instead of, you know, proving that, like, you know, Peter wrote First Peter, because a lot of, a lot of uh, skeptical scholars, critical scholars say Peter didn't write First Peter, Peter didn't write Second Peter. And they, they, you know, they say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how can we really know who wrote those? Um, it's a big argument. And so what we can do with Christian apologetics is just kind of do a little detour around all of that and just say, hey, um, we can go to later Christians, like like what we've talked about in the, in the historical evidence videos, we can go to people like Polycarp. We can go to people like Ignatius, and we can defend historically that like they knew the other apostles and what the apostles taught, you know, and, and stuff like this. So there's just all this historical evidence where you don't need the whole Bible to be true to prove Christianity true, the core message of, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, incarnate among us and died for our sins. And so, you know, so far at this point in the video series, we've just said, well, you know, nobody disputes that Paul wrote Galatians, that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in 55 AD, that Paul wrote... Uh, 2 Corinthians and that sort of thing. These are undisputed books. There are disputed books like 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, uh, 2nd Thessalonians, um, where the critical scholars, that's what they like to call themselves, they say Paul didn't write those books. Uh, you know, like, uh, I don't forget what else. I always forget which ones. Uh, it's Ephesians and then Colossians, the critical scholars change their mind. They argue with each other about that. But I think it tends to be not in there, but nobody disputes that Paul wrote First Saint Corinthians, you know, that kind of thing. And then, but then there's this other question of like, well, were the text interpolated? Were they were they altered throughout the passage of history? And uh, nobody disputes that the Gospels are our best source of information about the life of Jesus Christ. People, uh, critical scholars, do argue that they were heavily interpolated, but nonetheless, there are certain things in there that we can prove historically, like Jesus said that, and Jesus said that, and we have enough of that that it's like, well, okay, if Jesus said this, this, and this, he claimed to be like God's 
the guy that God had given eternal power to rule the universe forever and all this incredible thing about himself, then, uh, and there's other things too that we haven't even proved that he did claim he could forgive sins, that he went around working miracles of some kind, but like, apparently that's what people believed he was going around doing, you know, um, that he intentionally fulfilled messianic prophecies, uh, it's not the it's not the entirety of Mark. It's not the entirety of Luke. It's not the entirety of John. You know, you don't need any of Acts. But there's certain things in there we can prove to prove what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. To what Alvin Plantinga is a philosopher today, and he calls it uh, the great truths of the gospel. You know, uh, what uh, in evangelical Christian churches we just call it the gospel. You know, you might call it believing in Jesus or the ABCs of Christianity or, or the core gospel message. Um, I think in, if you want to use proper terms, it's called neo-Orthodox, which is just like there's, core, there's a core message of Christianity and like you don't have to have come to a decision about you know what those long ages of people in Genesis 5, people live at, like Adam living in 938 or, or whatever, Methuselah living in 969 and Lamech living set to 777 like you don't have to have an opinion about that or know about that to be a Christian and to believe the core doctrines the core creeds that the early church affirmed to be true and if you believe those you're a Christian okay to be an orthodox Christian so like you don't have to have an opinion on all of those things and so this is a this is a myth that really needs to be, you know, fault for Christian apologetics. I, I'm realizing now, like how important this is. This is sacred to atheists and Christians. I, I, I like one idea that we really need to kill is the idea that uh, you either believe all of the Bible or you believe none of it. Where did you get that from? Why do you believe that? Where did you get that from? Did you just hear somebody say that and just repeat it and not really question it? Like, where did you get that from? That is not what the early church believed. That is not how they gave us the Bible. That's not where the Bible comes from. That's not it at all. That's wrong. And atheists consider that this sacred thing because they want to poke one hole somewhere in the Bible and then Christianity falls. But the interesting thing is Christians believe it too. Then they get mad at liberal Christians who are willing to get rid of one part of the Bible or another part of the Bible. But like, the bottom line is that's not a biblical perspective. That's not a perspective of the people who gave us our books of the Bible. You see, the Bible is not a book. It's a collection of books. I think it's 66 books, and I forget how many authors. It's a little bit debated. But, like, the thing is, there were books that almost got in, but got rejected. There were books into the Bible. There were books that, like, you know, just barely got in, just squeaked in. Like, Revelation and James just squeaked in there. And, like... Basically, the, the early church had a win in doubt, throw it out rule that they went by. Um, so, like, they, if there was any doubt that this book should be in there, especially for them, you know, this is in the ancient world. This is just, you know, like, historians date the writing of the Bible maybe 49 AD, because they think, for, I've heard First Thessalonians from critical scholars are dated to 49. Uh, uh, the super uncontested one that nobody questions is uh, 1 Corinthians 55 and then John around 90 is, is closing it off the gospel of John um, this is uh, and then you, you've got later Christians you know starting to work on this you know by, by the year 200 they're really working on it it's kind of wrapped up I think around around 300 uh, but like they really put the nail in the coffin between three and four hundred I think at the Synod of Hippo I think is when they finally all the churches come together Let's see Synod 
of hippo. Okay. And then that's when they come together. 393, okay. And so that's when they really affirm, like, I believe that's it. Let me double check. Council of Bishops. And they come down on, like, what exactly is going to be, yeah, in the... There were some disagreements, so the Catholic Church versus the Eastern, Church, Eastern Churches disagreed just a little bit. But anyway, it's called the canon, or like the biblical canon, or basically all the books they got in the Bible, what that means. So, um, think about that. Like, There are some books that almost got in. So like, if you disagree and think, well, I think that book shouldn't be in there, you have good reasons. Like, okay, well, you're just disagreeing with these Christians that came a long time ago, but, like, maybe you think they were wrong about getting that one in there, you know? And, like, one of their rules was, uh, can we verify that, you know, say Paul wrote this, or James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this? Can we, is the authorship something that they could verify, you know, back then? So, like, if that's the case, then... No. Um, you don't have to believe all the Bible or any of it. That's a false dilemma. That's irrational. You can believe some of the Bible. Like, in fact, you can prove certain things in the Bible and, and, and affirm the core doctrines of Christianity and then just throw all the rest of it out and still be a Christian. I don't think that's the correct thing to do, but someone could do that. Okay. Um, and still be a Christian because they're able to prove enough to affirm the core doctrines of Christianity. You know, like, like you don't need it to be the inspired word of God to affirm the doctrines of Christianity. You just need to be able to prove that, like, you know, Paul wrote this, you know, this right here really happened, um, you know, Peter, you know, John, that kind of thing. P Peter and John really believed X about Jesus. Uh, you know, things like that. Like, you don't need the whole Bible it doesn't stand and fall together. And here's the kicker. Was the Bible interpolated by scribes who recopied it? Yes. Yes. They made lots of accidental changes. Like, think about that. Think let ask why don't you just take any book of the Bible and sit down and just try to copy it by hand and see how well you do and if you make a goof somewhere and see how many times it takes you to uh, recopy it, the book of the Bible by hand and never mess up one time and miss the mess up. I mean, I'm talking about a real mess up. I hope you do it in pencil. Of course, of course you're going to make mistakes. In fact, the thing is, when you look at ancient manuscripts and, and manuscript is a word, a fancy word that means handwritten, manual script handwritten so before the printing press we have more manuscripts for the new testament and really for this video uh should make this point as clear as possible we're not looking at the old testament because that's a whole other ball game and it's an important ball game but like we're going to avoid that and just do the new testament because that'll take that'll be enough work for us that's enough of a task that we should be happy that we got that far okay it's a big job but, like, given that there's so many copies, and there are more copies that were made in the ancient past, the more copies you make, the more mistakes get made. But also there's this question of intentional changes. Were there intentional changes? Yes. Were they important intentional changes? Yes. Were they made to, you know, were they intentionally fixing someone's past mistakes sometimes? Yes. But were they sometimes trying to change the text of the Bible to promote a particular theology or doctrine or view? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay? You have to come to terms with the reality. Absolutely Y-E-S, yes. Okay? Now, 
Can we reconstruct the original? No. We cannot. <laughs> and, yes, we can. And that is the reality of the situation that confuses everyone. So, like, you get these people, you know, talking about it. And it's like, we can't reconstruct the original. That's true. We, we cannot reconstruct the original. But it's also true that we can reconstruct the original. And that reality is confusing for people. And then there's this question of forgery, which is a whole other question we'll, we'll save for the end. But, like, when it comes to the question of interpolation, it's like, can we reconstruct the original? Through all the interpolations, yes and no. <laughs> and if you have a modern study Bible that has footnotes and stuff, or almost all Bibles have some kind of footnotes nowadays, then you're actually already familiar with what I'm talking about. And it's not that big a deal. But the changes were important, but they also weren't important. <laughs> and, like, it's just confusing and it's hard to explain and so, people hear what they want to hear because this topic is so important to them and so sacred. And you get atheists who it's, it's sacred to them that the Bible has been corrupted and altered and changed and it's full of errors and contradictions and forgeries. And everyone changed it to push their doctrines. And then you get Christians who think it's, you know, absolutely impossible that anything like that could happen. You know, because Christians affirm that this is God's Word and God's Word is without error. But then if you look at the statements that Christian denominations today affirm about biblical inspiration, they just say that the originals, or what's called the original autographs, which is like an autograph, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but like what that means is you would hire a guy to write the thing, and then like at the end, Paul or, or Peter or whoever would sign it and autograph it, and then you would send it out. So the autograph is the original, everything else is the copy. Because you don't, the, the first one is not a copy, it's the original, or technically the autograph. And what are doctrines, whatever, you know, conservative denomination you're a part of, the doctrine of inspiration says that the original autograph is the only one that's without error and inspired by God. But the copies have errors. And they do, like, they have, they're filled with spelling mistakes. There, are those not errors, you know, like when somebody spells a word wrong or like accidentally forgets, like leave something out by accident or like skips a sentence by accident. Like if you read, copy something by hand, sometimes you just skip sentences by accident. You know, like uh, sometimes you uh, write the same word twice by accident. That's an error made by a scribe who's copying it. That's totally a thing. And like, so can we, but the thing is, if the original autograph is the only one that's divinely inspired, then like, can we reconstruct the original autograph? No. In a sense, no, and in a sense, yes, but like, this is important, you know, like, uh, like, for example, we know through historical evidence that there were there were different Christian groups. I mean, the Bible even attests to this. The Bible tells us about the first controversy within Christianity between, I don't know, we'll call them the Pauline Christians, the Paul side, and the circumcision side is what he called them. Although, according to the Bible, you got James and Peter and Paul are all, you know, on the, on the same side against the circumcision side. But basically, that disagreement was one where one side said that all Christians have to follow the uh, all you know all the Jewish law to be saved, and the Pauline side said no. As Paul put it in Romans, Christ is the end of the law, so there will be salvation for all who believe, and that's the Jewish law he's talking about there. And he goes into detail about this in in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians, but like. Uh, the thing is, Paul is, uh, that, that's a disagreement. We have Christians who come later, like, for example, Irenaeus, who I think Irenaeus, let's see, Irenaeus. When did he live? Just to get an idea. So uh, 130 to 
to 202 AD or, or CE, whichever you prefer. I'm just grew up with AD and it's familiar to me. I know it offends some people, but like I just, I guess I don't, I don't know. I don't really, it don't, neither one really bugs me, but like in my mind, I just hear AD when people say CE and I'm like, what? Oh, AD, you know. But like, uh, anyway, he, t- he talks about different Christian groups and how there's one called the Ebionites. And they seem to be very similar to this group that Paul, in his writings, calls, he calls them the circumcision. Because circumcision is like the first Jewish law. It's like you're, you, you obey that command and it's your entry. Um, he, talks about, he talks about other, other groups that he disagrees with. And that they, for example, the Ebionites would only they only accepted the Gospel of Matthew as the only one the only reliable source of information about what Jesus taught. They believed you had to follow all of the Jewish law. And according to Irenaeus, they had they had changed the Gospel of Matthew so that it fit better with their doctrine. And also importantly, the the, the Ebionites believed that Jesus was only a man and God adopted him they were adoptionists that god adopted him into their family so that he would and then he was ending into god's family and then he died for our sins and all that because he was such a good man and then you have another group that uh we know are called the the docetists um and they that they come later you've got books of the bible like uh first john four for the book of first john is flat out calling out the docetists You've got the the Gospel of Luke seems to be addressing them, and the, and the Docetists were a different group that went the other way, and they appear to be a Greek group under Greek influence because the ideas clearly resonate strongly. The idea that Jesus would have been human at all would have been a hard one for Greek people who came from a Greek background to swallow. So, like they said that Jesus wasn't even a physical entity at all; he just pretended to be and made it look like he was it was all an illusion he didn't die he just that was all a pretense he was never physical at all he's purely spiritual being who just imitated what it was like for us to be a physical being and i don't know if we have any evidence that they had their own books or anything like that that they had altered books of the bible to push you know certain their their view then you've also got you've got this group called the Gnostics, which is like a like a wide array of different groups, but they all have a lot in common. And the reason there's so many of them is because within that group, you, according to Irenaeus, you would gain uh, prestige within that group by coming up with new doctrines. <laughs> it's like so, it's a little bit of a different animal. Um, and they had their own books of the Bible too. But it's important to understand about the Gnostics. We have some of theirs. We found some of theirs. There's this uh, jar called the Nag Hammadi Library. So Nag Hammadi. The Nag Hammadi Library. It was a jar that was found in Egypt that contained these old papyrus. And I think you can read every bit of it uh, online. 52 uh, mostly Gnostic uh, writings. Uh, Leather bound papyrus uh, codices. Um, uh, found in the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi in 1945. So around the same time the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, is a ton of Gnostic texts. We've got like stuff like Gospel of Judas, you know, Gospel of Mary, and things like that. And, and some of them were never lost, you know. Like, uh, so it's not like this, you know. But this was a this was a big find. Um. <coughs> They were apparently buried uh, when a Christian condemned the use of such books, and then uh, somebody buried it somewhere in a jar. <laughs> but like uh, the uh, for the Gnostics, it's it's confusing. Like they have the Gospel of Judas, for example, where Jesus, you know, comes in the room and the and Peter and the apostles are all praying over the supper, and Jesus starts laughing at them and saying that they shouldn't pray to God, and uh, that's because all of the Gnostics believe that like. The God who created our world was evil and uh, physical, and that's the God of the Old Testament. But Jesus was sent by the true good God who's purely spiritual. And uh, 
some of us have the God within us because another God has put that within us. Not all people. And I think, like, no women, although Gnostics differ on that. Irenaeus seems to think that, like, women can have the God inside them. And he seems to describe the Gnostics that way. But from what I've, as I understand the Gospel of Mary, it's not that way. And the Gnostics tend to be misogynistic and no women. And I think the Apocryphon of John is a, is a major uh, text for them. But like, So anyway, the confusing thing is like, they have their other Gospels. Those got, for the Gnostics, their, their writings are not the source of information or what justifies their beliefs the way it works for other Christian groups and especially Orthodox Christians, the, or as I say, the Christians who are right. Okay. <laughs> you know, who, who we have inherited, uh, their doctrines. And I, we're going to talk about why I think they're right. But like, uh, and then these other groups like the Ebionites and these, these docetic groups, I don't know about the docetists, but like the Ebionites for sure, they relied on the testimony handed down to them through these documents. Or they claim to, okay. And then the question becomes like, well, if the Ebionites are going to change Matthew to fit with their doctrine, and then claim that it's the source for it because they're they believe it because Matthew said it, and Matthew knew Jesus. Well, doesn't that apply to the Orthodox Christians? And maybe the Orthodox Christians are actually heretical, and maybe nobody really knows what Jesus really taught because everyone was changing the Bible, and there's all these different Christian groups, and you know, that's an important question. It needs to be addressed, and uh, that's what we're here to do with this video. But like, the thing is, before we go any further, I just want to make this point about the, the Gnostics. The way Gnosticism worked is like, there's like secret knowledge about the non-physical spiritual world, and it would be contained in these books, or they could just tell it to you. And once they tell it to you, if you had the God inside you, it, you would like awaken that. And then once you once that was awakened, you didn't need any gospel of Judas or gospel of Mary. You didn't need any of that. Like you could just that they, they would just like read the Bible as it is, as we have it, and like you know they could tell that the words mean something other than what they mean. It's all coded to mean something else, and that like all that stuff about Jesus dying for our sins and all that, you know, that was all just a cover story. You know, um, and resurrection, like they think Jesus never died, but he was just a man who was possessed by this spiritual being. And then when they killed him, this the spiritual being let, jumped out. And so like all the Gnostics would like, they could like, they, they would like read a parable and say, this parable pretends to be teaching us this lesson, and, you know, about faith in the kingdom of God, you know, and the mustard seed or something like that. But like, you know, or the story where, Jesus heals this woman, but the woman is actually secretly represents this like super being in the heavens. And it, it, this is teaching us that there's a, a level of the 30 gods and a level of the four, you know, and like they would, they would find this stuff. It's coded in there. It's like a Bible code hidden in there. And they, that's what they, and they, they knew it because they had the God inside them. Okay. So like, that's why you have so many different uh, Gnostic schools, you know, so many different Gnostic groups, and a certain Gnostic guy like Valentinian or v Valentinus, you know, be becomes a big shot within that, and he has a lot of followers, you know, or something like that. Or I think Marcion was, you know, but like just to point that out, like they didn't, they didn't justify their beliefs on the basis of their alternative gospels. Um, that's not how it worked for them. But there were other groups that did do that. The Ebionites is an example of a group that absolutely did that. And for their Gospel of Matthew said something else. you know. And they rejected everything Paul said. Paul was a naughty boy, according to them. <laughs> okay, so I'm just trying to set us up for the point that we need to make. Um, and, and then we can kind of get into like... Uh, 